So I want to welcome everyone who has come today to see Mark, to hear him, and to meet everybody. And we're just thrilled that we are working with Mark and that we are able to present to you his debut solo exhibition uh, with Nancy Margolis Gallery, and it's titled Story Paintings. He received his MFA from the New York, uh, New York Studio School of Painting and his BFA from the School of the Art Institutes of Chicago. He's based in Brooklyn, New York now, and he has an extensive, he's had an extensive painting career. His work is included in many public and private collections worldwide. Many are well-known publications and they have written about Mark, his talent and his sophisticated handling of paint. And this includes the New York Times, Washington Post and the City Arts Magazine. Today, Mark teaches a portrait class at the National Arts Club in New York City and is an artist in resident at Marymount School of New York. I am very pleased to turn the afternoon program over to Lillian Thorpe. Lillian is the Associate Director of Nancy Margolis Gallery. And Lillian will share some additional information about today's program. Lillian. Thank you, Nancy. Hello, I am Lillian Thorpe. Uh, today, we will be conversing with Mark Milroy about his work as we look at the 10 oil paintings featured in his solo exhibition, Story Paintings. About halfway through, there will be an opportunity to ask questions or make comments. Uh, feel free at any point to type a question into the chat box and I will read it at the end, or you can click the raise hand icon and I will call on you. All right, let's begin by looking at the paintings. Mark, can you see my screen? I can, we're all okay. set. Perfect. I dig the Annie. Yes. Um, I love this painting and I thought it, this painting Modigliani would be a great place to start uh, because it combines the three genres of painting that you tend to focus on, portraiture, still life, and landscape. I'd love to hear a bit about your process and what draws you to the subjects that you choose to include in your paintings. Great. Um, so it, it's always something that has affinity to, to, to me. Throughout my, uh, throughout my entire career from the beginning, um, especially King, say, on, on Still Life, um, one of my very first paintings was a chair with a little desk next to it. And on the desk were a couple books. And then pinned up on the wall behind the uh, chair were a few pictures. I think I painted that 1992 when I very first started painting. Um, if, if some people know me, uh, I'm pretty severely dyslexic. And so my interest in painting books came out of uh, the idea of always viewing a book as an object, not necessarily something that you read, but looking at it as a still life or a beautiful object. And so they started I just started to put them in. So often if I choose a book, it's a book that really has a beautiful meaning to me. And I would scour Strand and go and collect certain little old books like this. Um, everything else, you know, there's certain aspects, say for this painting where it's, it's um, oh, how can I say like, uh, you know, it's plants, people, there's a duality between the double portrait here, which is sort of an uncommon double portrait. The idea that the, the direction of the book is laying flat this way and the other figure is this way. Um, during COVID, I love painting people and I love having people to the studio. During COVID, it was pretty hard to get anyone to come and sit for you, friend or just a model. So I started to put paintings of paintings into, um, into my, into my pictures. So this is a little painting that 
I, I did that, uh, you know, as things are sitting around the studio, they just might catch my eye and then I'll sort of start to uh, make the composition and paint the picture. That's so interesting. I love hearing how you, you know, paint your paintings during COVID when you were missing physical sitters. That's so yeah. interesting. Yeah. One thing that I think is so engaging in your work that we can really see in a painting like Cowboy Up is how you blend or blur the lines between truth and fiction. And when I look at a painting like this, I get the impression that it's an imagined scene. Um, I'd love to know, you know, specifically maybe the narrative or the story behind a work like this and how you conceive of your narratives. Was this mostly from imagination or was any part of it grounded in reality? Yeah, so again, it's a combination. Um, I, I, I did a residency in this, hang on, this, well, this is really, a, there's a lot going on here. I did a residency in Scotland and it was at this uh, place called the Dumfries House. And the stone walls at a certain time of day would just kind of go pink. And that stayed with me. Um, I, a long time ago, I had a farm and it had beautiful stone walls in that farm. Um, during my residency at Dumfries, uh, mm -hmm. there were people riding horses around and riding by these stone walls. And this image, you know, sometimes there's images that um, they, they just stick, they, they stay with you. The, the other thing that was going on here during when I painted this, um, I had just come through, through a, uh, a, a really difficult divorce in my life. So everything is of a pers very personal nature. And so the whole Cowboy Up series, it first started with um, the very first painting was about Geronimo, which is another whole childhood narrative that I'm exploring. And then the Cowboy Up is this phrase that I came across, um, which really means like when, when things get tough, pick yourself up and du dust yourself off. Now, the rider actually came right around the corner from where I live in Brooklyn in Prospect Park because there's, they still ride horses through the park. And so I'd go and visit the park and draw the horses and draw the riders and the horse. The, the lake is from my childhood and that is a part of this hook which I've used repeatedly over the decades uh, where I grew up in St. Thomas where just a stone throws from Lake Erie. And each way you look at the lake, it would bend into this beautiful hook. And so, and then the crowd is this idea of, of uh, you know, almost being a voyeur watching a scene. Mm. That's really interesting. And I know Nancy and I were discussing earlier how the figures in the foreground sort of each feel like they are absorbed inwardly. They're not necessarily interacting with each other. They feel like they are within their own worlds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very much so. Um, I, w I just want to say something about the title of this exhibition. Uh, Mark, I love the title that you chose. Thank you. Uh, story paintings. You efficiently mix the imaginary with reality and all very touchingly expressed. Um, I would like to hear more conversation about the themes that you are attracted to. Could you do that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the, t the title of the show, Story Paintings, um, through, through a discussion, uh, we, you know, we were talking about a lot of people will use the word narrative. And I always called these story paintings. Even in my studio when I started making, you know, larger scale narratives, I, I referred to them as story paintings. So my, the subjects are um, uh, this idea of um, Geronimo, which may be about, um, you know, this idea to never give up, uh, perseverance, um, Another subject is uh, 
a whole series of chalkboard paintings that I did, which were all about um, this idea of a little kid looking into his soup and uh, it looks like a bowl of alphabet soup. And so a lot of the themes, is, you know, there is this idea of childhood memory, but what I'm also hoping to always explore is that someone else can come to the painting with their own narrative. Mm -hmm. and their own feelings and their own thoughts or their own story and superimpose their own story into the painting as well. I have one question about the figures. Yeah. <clears throat> the, they all look very similar. The, the shape of the face and um, it could be the same person. It could be. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. There was part of this um, you know, part of this painting first started off, sometimes my paintings, they'll start off with one idea and it will morph and change into another idea. And so there was this other narrative that, uh, this other story that I was gonna, um, I, I won't get into the whole story now, but it was about a, a, a crowd of uh, kids. And um, we were where I grew up and, uh, it's um, when, when I'm painting the faces often with a crowd like this, you know, a more formal aspect is just this idea of laying down color, creating color relationships. Let's see what's there and let that grow out of it to inform the painting that way. But then there's um, on another level, there's mo the more formal level of creating this composition where it's very flat, stacked, but still giving a sense of space. I think that's a good segue into Farron. Um, one thing that really I find so interesting about this painting is it continues the landscape that we started to see in Cowboy Up. Um, in the top left hand, left hand corner, we see this uh, curving, you know, body of water, and we see that repeated here. And I think that's, you know, a great subtle visual way to tie your work together. Um, Nancy was talking about how the different figures look similar, and I think Farron looks very um, specific and distinct, as if you were painting her from life. And yeah. I wonder if you were, and if you could tell us a bit about you know, the process behind this painting. Yeah, so I, you're, you're absolutely right. Farron was painted from life and she's, a, uh, she's a, an old dear friend of mine. Um, so I had, I had a few starts of uh, painting Farron and then um, uh, and nothing really, they, they, they were just starts and our paths kept missing one another. And then uh, we, we both missed each other in Maine and over the summer of uh, 2020. And on her travels back home, uh, she stopped at the studio. And so I actually painted this in my studio in, in From Life and her face, her hands pretty much um, a lot of that was done within one session or as much as I could physically do within one session. Um, she was sitting in a wooden chair. I superimposed, um, I superimposed the lawn chair. And since we both had just been spent time in Maine, I was in at my uh, dear friend, Joe Frenson's home in Brooksville and Farron has a, uh, uh, a place in um, Vinyl Haven. Uh, I decided to do this idea of Maine, but as you can see this hook that I've been somewhat obsessed with in my landscapes when I think of bodies of water um, from my childhood memories came back into it. Although where I grew up, we have no islands in the distance like they do in Maine or, uh, you know, where, where I grew up, we would uh, uh, dive off the, uh, what was it called? off the end of the pier where the lighthouse was, if we could, I don't think you can get out there anymore. But um, so I put a little diver into the top corner as a little surprise. Right. Uh, to give this idea of summer. 
but that's how that painting came 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 through. Well, you know, uh, I just wanted to say a little bit about her because uh, I find this portrait particularly captivating. And she's sitting there dreamily and looking out toward what? <laughs> Contemplating something, maybe serious, maybe not. It's very easy to be embraced by her intensity and mood. Yeah, and and Farron, Farron is yeah, Farron's a, a terrific artist, an incredible artist in her own right, and she's also, um, a, 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 you know, she's an amateur uh, gemologist, maybe. Mm -hmm. I, gosh, I hope I don't butcher that, Farron, if you're watching. Um, but uh, you know, she worked in 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 the jewelry industry for quite a long time, and so there's certain subtle things like, for me. Um, one of the most beautiful parts of this painting is her hands with those rings mm -hmm. and paying, paying, you know, special consideration to that. Um, you know, the gaze of the sitter, um, it, you know, through when I paint, uh, I don't like people just to sit there stoned like a statue. So they're moving around, their eyes are darting here and there. And so I think the, these eyes with the placement, I just wanted to create something that would maybe invite the viewer into the painting a little stronger, create, create something, something a bit, um, bit more engaging. Mm -hmm. Well, her gaze is absolutely engaging. And I also love the details of all the rings on her fingers. And I think that's one of the clues that makes me know that this is a real person yeah. um, as opposed to someone imaginary. Um, they're very specific. In story paintings, you have um, several small scale landscapes, which are so beautiful. And one thing that draws me to them is I sort of pick up a sense of immediacy with this work. Um, the mark making and the brushwork feels very spontaneous and in the moment. Um, and I wondered if you painted these on plein air, um, if they are real landscapes. Um, I would just love to hear the context of creating these uh, small scale landscapes. Yeah, can we go back to the uh, shot with all four? Absolutely, yep. Yeah, so all four of these were um, uh, different. Um, the one of the crow was, no, they were all from, I believe, uh, this last fall. Or the one of the crow was from, from maybe mid, mid to late spring, actually. I believe so. But um, yeah, they were all uh, plein air painted. Um, these paintings for for the uh, for the landscapes, believe it or not, I really I really try not to make anything up. I just really try and respond exactly to what's in front of me. So, for instance, the one of the black crow, there was this I think it was a crow, but there was a very large blackbird, and he was calling at me and bouncing around, bouncing around on this pine tree. And the pine tree just came into uh, my view a little bit. And finally, I was like, OK, I give up. I'm going to put him in it. And uh, I, no, I'm not joking. When I did, he, he took off. <laughs> <laughs> so but um, I was up in uh, Salisbury, Connecticut at some close friends um, place. And they were gracious. They, I had a little studio and beautiful place to stay. And, I, I went out every day and uh, painted painted from their property, which had just absolutely breathtaking gardens and views. Mm -hmm. And um, they're all done on the spot. And when I do these, as I have over the last several decades, I try not to touch them once they come out of the landscape. So it kind it keeps there's it keeps a freshness to the picture. I, I wanted to mention uh, something about the smaller paintings because small sometimes is more beautiful than big. And I, each of them is really, they're quite beautiful. And um, Allium, which is this one on the right on the end, um, 
is part of this group and is particularly noteworthy as a painting. The canvas is painted with glorious color, I think, are wildflowers. And in spite of their size, the small works remain strong and amazing paintings. And you're talking about it, and I, I, I'm glad because yeah. I felt that they, they are very, very, really beautiful. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah, I've never, um, I, I, throughout my entire career, I've never believed or fell into this idea that bigger is better somehow, mm -hmm. or the bigger the painting, the more impact. You never do. No, no. Um, well, no, you know I, what, sometimes it is. It, it can be, absolutely. It can be if you want yeah, to, yeah. you know, if you want to give that experience. But one of my favorite paintings in the Met is this little tiny Tarot painting of the cow. Mm -hmm. And it's about this big. And I think it's, it, it's an overwhelmingly powerful, memorable image. As much as maybe, you know, uh, a great big, big colossal work. So, um, yeah, and, and I, one thing that I absolutely love about these uh, smaller paintings too is the immediacy. Um, you know, one, one brush stroke on a 12 inch square canvas can describe so much more than it can say on a four by six foot canvas. Mm -hmm. And so you can, uh, it, uh, it, it just lends itself to that. Right, it seems like it's the perfect scale to work on when you're working directly from nature and you're in the moment yeah. and yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you mentioned in your artist statement that when you're painting, you act as both the image maker and the image seeker. And I think that's a really interesting concept that, you know, parts of the story unfurl as you're working. And I'd love to just hear more about that concept of being an image maker and more specifically an image seeker. If yeah. A little bit about that. Um, so I talked to, I talked to uh, the little girls that I teach at Marymount about this. And there's this wonderful poem um, called To Paint Is To Love Again. And um, gosh, I'm having a mental blank on, on the author. If someone knows, throw it in the chat, please. Um, and uh, he talks about, he actually says when, you know, say, say you're sitting on the toilet, emptying your bowels. Um, he says, uh, as you're staring at the linoleum floor, all of a sudden you see a face staring back at you. And I always tell my, my kids, it's this idea of say, looking at the clouds and what do you see up there? Um, what do you see between the buildings? To get them to look at a different, different mm -hmm. way. And so sometimes if you just lay down a ton of color or create some color relationships or start to scrub some color or you're looking at your plant and you start there and maybe an edge of that plant will inform a face. Mm -hmm on the other side and you put it there, then maybe you start to think, oh, th like this one, for instance, I painted in the studio where I am right now. And it was right after I came out of the landscape in Connecticut. And so I was really missing the landscape. And, you know, you come back to Brooklyn and there's sirens and this and this. And um, this is sort of just sort of an imagined face of uh, uh, my friend, Nate. Uh, uh, Tom, who uh, is the gardener, and he was responsible for these gorgeous gardens that I was painting in uh, up in Connecticut. And so it, it's not a portrait of him, but it's this idea of this person looking into, looking into these houseplants now. And so coming out of the landscape and dealing now, wanting nature so much more, I turned to paint my houseplants. Got it. That's so interesting. Thank you for sharing that. It was, it's, uh... um, this is a really interesting painting and I have a lot of questions, but um, definitely this is one of the works where I feel like the content is just sort of 
sprung from your imagination or maybe a memory or a specific story. Um, and one thing that you and I haven't really spoken about that I'm curious about is whether your two young sons influence any of your work. Um, I might be reading too much into it, but I feel like I see an E-M right on the tree, maybe yeah. in Milroy, and I think I see an A over here for Angus. I could be wrong, but um, I'm wondering if your work or maybe this painting are at all influenced by your children. I, I, I think a little bit, not as much as one might think, but I do often um, will hide little things in my paintings like that, where if I'm painting a forest of trees or something, I'll carve their initials into the tree on the canvas and not tell anyone and it's there. And, um, but this, this comes from, um, as you can see, this is number three in the series and they're fairly large works and they come from my childhood. Uh, every single summer we would play this game. Essentially, most people would say, oh, you're playing Capture the Canoe. We called it Bogman. I was the Bogman. And my brother, Danny, I don't know if Danny's here in the audience or not, but uh, him and his buddies would always commandeer our canoe. And we had this amazing backyard with a, a creek that went into a river. And then me and my childhood buddy, Harold, our job was we would go out early before they would get in the canoe and we would try and sabotage the route. And so we would hide up into the muck, up into our chin. And um, basically it just evolves around that. Um, just this childhood uh, thoughts. Um, I, I guess I turned uh, in 2000, let me see. So 2005, um, I was 37, I had a major heart attack and nearly died. And then I had another one in 2014, which That's nearly got me. And so when you, so through these experiences, I think maybe it just made me super sentimental perhaps, but it made me reflect upon my life like, like I, I never have before. And so then I, that's where a lot of these um, story paintings kind of come from this, this thoughts of uh, where do you come from? Who are you? What, what, has, what has shaped you? What has influenced you? And how can you, you know, it took me a long time to figure out how to turn these stories into pictures. Um, but uh, there, there you have it. I, I, I'm quite fond of this one. Uh, as I am of all the, because they have such a deep personal narrative for me. Right. And even with the deep personal narrative, it's still, it leaves so much room for curiosity and personal interpretations from your audience, which yeah, exactly. is a real talent of yours. Um, you can be describing these narratives that relate to you, but keep them open-ended, which yeah. I really love about your work. Um, the last painting that we will speak about before I open up the questions. Um, they, it's called it's Fall. Good. And you've been working on a series of felled trees paintings. Um, this one on the right is another one in the series that isn't in the show, but it's available through NMG. Um, and it seems like you paint trees a lot in your work, but they tend to be in the background or maybe framing the edges of a canvas. And I think it's really interesting that in this series, they become the subject. And I'm really curious to hear what draws you to this theme and this series in particular. And um, I would just love to hear a little more about it. Sure, so um, a, few, a few things going on. Uh, these are all, from, from my walks through Prospect Park and going with my, with my sketchbooks and, and uh, you know, sitting, drawing, they would just um, chop, chop up the uh, trees and just leave them there. Um, I, and, and, you know, not to make, make it too COVID related, but um, again, you know, not having people coming in. I actually worked on some most of these for about two years, these paintings. Mm -hmm. And um, I started to see, uh, especially on the one on the left of the screen, mm -hmm. that 
with the way these logs were left intended or not, they started to look fig like figures, like this like big sleeping slain giant. And so that started to enter my, my mind. Um, the other thing too is um, at this old farmhouse I had, I actually took great pleasure in chainsawing up the firewood and splitting the firewood and feeding the wood stoves. And gosh, I'm really full of sentiment, aren't I? Um, <laughs> anyway, so um, I would, I would, <laughs> a lot of times I'd walk around the park and be like, God, there's some really great firewood laying around here. And, and um, it just, I was like, you know what? I think, I think I see something here and let's see about making it into a painting. And that, that's, that's how it started. The one on the right, Again, it's um, uh, it's it's dealing with these these. It's kind of remarkable that they still ride horses through the park, um, right along with the bicycle riders, and um, so it's this thought of this um, this fleeting moment where you might see something out of the corner of your eye, and when you're living in New York and Brooklyn, and all of a sudden you look over and there's a line of horses coming coming by the woods it's quite a powerful image and so that's where this that's how that painting came about got it well i'm glad you um expressed this because it's definitely something i had you know thought of on my own is that these paintings especially the one on the left it reminds me of a portrait very much so mm. like a portrait of nature or a portrait of trees and it gives the presence of a figure even though in the one on the left it's just nature i think that's really interesting well i am going to open it up to questions now because i think we have some good ones coming in so let me just quickly take a look through these um okay one question is they would like to hear more about the paint, thick and thin. Do you use medium? Do you wipe out or scrape or paint by adding new things on top? Everything. <laughs> um, yeah, I, well, I don't, I don't add anything to the oil. Um, I don't use any fillers or anything, it, you know. Uh, I went through a phase when I was, you know, starting out, I was heavily influenced, like, I, I, I was really trying to make paintings as thick as uh, Frank Orbach and Leon Kossoff. And, but in still then, it was still just pure oil out of the tube. Um, if, I, if I'm going to do a wash or something, I will just uh, use my turpentine and thin it down and draw with the paint. Uh, I don't make any preliminary drawings on the canvas. It's, it's oil paint first. And I will just keep drawing and paint and draw and paint. And you know, I'm not against like using a knife when I'm putting putting the paint on, but I don't want that. I never I don't want that to be the the vehicle that um is uh that might overshadow, like I don't want that to be the vehicle that might overshadow, say the story I'm telling or the the picture I'm trying to make. Um, a lot of times it, it's very easy to get um, seduced by the, the materiality of oil paint mm -hmm. or even, even a thick acrylic paint. And often that can overshadow the subject. Mm -hmm. And so it's always like that. If, if I don't like what I'm doing, I'll scrape it down, rub it out and do it again. And so then it's through all those attempts that I'm, I'm, I'm building up the surfaces. And if I get it, I'll leave it. Right. Um, thank you. We have a question from Lorraine. Uh, go ahead, Lorraine. Hi. Hi, Mark. Hi, Lorraine. Hi. As you know, I've been a fan of yours forever. Um, and what the question I'd like to ask is about your, um, your compositions. Um, they're very unusual. And, and I find a lot of tension in them and everything except the landscapes, the small landscapes, not. They're just beautiful. Um, but there is definitely something um, edgy about everything, even, and your portraits too. And is that conscious? And, and you know, I notice you flatten space in, in uh, unusual ways. 
and you're certainly, you know, you're off center and your things are going out of the painting like Bonard in a way, sometimes that reminds me of the way he uses people. So could you comment on that? Yeah, um, the, the compositions are um, never really premeditated. They're never really, um, you know, it's, it's all intuitive. I guess it would be the best way to put it. It's just really, truly intuitive. It always has been. I've never really thought too much about composition. If it's not working, I'll shift, I'll shift something in the picture to make it work. I always think I, I like to, um, you know, so, sometimes, uh, and this is even subconscious, but just an idea of, say you're relating a uh, uh, picture to music and how you might have some, some fast notes and beats and then you might have a quieter space, but it needs to take you back into the picture. And so you, you, you always want to, for me, I always want to keep the viewer engaged so that you don't come, come up to this corner and fall off, right? Or it's just not a big dull spot. But, but that's not to say that you can't have a quietness within the picture, but hopefully that quietness still operates as as the uh, within the whole context of the painting, does it, does that answer Lorraine a little bit? But yeah. it, it's truly really uh, intuitive. I don't think about it a lot. Do you feel that your paintings have a lot of tension to them? That do you do you see that tension in them or experience it or have other people mentioned that? Yeah, other people have mentioned that or or you know an intensity mm -hmm. to to them or yeah. But, um, it's not something that I think about, or it's not something that I will consciously say, I want to make a painting yeah. with, with a lot of tension. Mm -hmm. Right? So okay. I think it's just, just uh, what I do. Thank you. Thanks, that was Mark. a great question. Thank you, Lorraine. Um, we have a question from Jill. Go ahead, Jill. Hi, it's less of a question than a comment. I just wanted to um, say I was so fortunate that my first year of graduate school at the New York Studio School, I was um, happily situated right next to Mark. So I got to know him. And then our second year, we were studio mates. And let me tell you that he really improved the quality of my time because Mark's cup is always half full, regardless of what he's going through. And you, I mean, you can see that in his paintings and he shares that with other people. Um, so I just wanted to say how grateful I am. Nice. To have you do you, that. Jill. Thank you, Jill. <laughs> Let me just quickly ask this question from Rosie. It's sort of a two-part question. Um, the first is, are there particular artists inspirations for your style? Um, have you always painted in this style or would you say it is something you wanted um, to work on and develop? Yeah, gosh, influence. Um, there's a great quote by um, Philip Guston that he says, uh, uh, you just don't, you, wait, everyone comes from somewhere, you just don't fall out of the sky. Mm -hmm. And I love that because, um, you know, when I was young and making my portraits and as a young painter, you're, you're just everything, you want everything to be yours and original. And so, you know, uh, I think I made my first hundred plus paintings without stepping foot into an art gallery or a museum or, anything. Um, and the first uh, art historian in London, Ontario that uh, came up to me and he said, uh, do you know the works of Oscar Kokoschka and Soutine? And I very naively said, no, but I sure would love to meet these guys. <laughs> and and uh, so he said, you get in my art history class immediately. And, um, you know, so then I spent the next year making Soutine paintings. And then after that, I made a bunch of Oscar Kokoschka paintings and Kossoff paintings and Orbach. And then I became just enthralled with the British figuratives. Um, all I've ever been concerned with as a painter is just having my own true, true, honest voice. Uh, 
you know, as you can see, I'm working in probably one of the oldest genres. We're painting landscapes, portraits, still lifes. And to, it's almost like trying to reinvent the wheel in many ways. But I think we, we all have our own marks that we make. And I think then if you, if you get that connection of your hand, your eye, and your heart, and you make those marks, um, all your pictures will be your own. And that's, that's how I've really been um, working. Uh, you know, there's, there's a laundry list of painters that I love and look at, but that's generally when I'm, you know, uh, working, it's just uh, me, and, me and my brush and my palettes. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we have two questions coming up. The first is from Amy. What did you learn at the New York Studio School that was most interesting and helpful? Are your drawings just for you as preparation? Do you think they'd be interesting to show with the paintings they're related to? Yes, I, I would love to show my drawings um, with the pictures. I think they're extremely relevant. A lot of, a lot of, my, um, a lot of my initial ideas first come from, um, you know, little, these, these little, um, these little uh, sketchbooks. Um, I, I pulled this one out. I hope everyone can see it. This is the very first, this is the very first little teeny tiny drawing that I did for Pinafore 3. And so that's really the, the birth of a lot of my ideas in that way. Th these no, those are like, say, a uh, poet, scribbling on his napkins, perhaps. Um, through the New York Studio School, I, I can't remember the exact first part of the question, sorry, but um, the most important thing that I got out of it was A, the courage to take on these large scale narratives that were at the time seeming to be too complex for me to, 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 to uh, from my idea to the visual to make that leap. Um, the other thing is um, we have to write a thesis and that is probably my biggest accomplishment. Um, writing, I wrote a small chapbook here, it's in the chapbook form now, writing the, the, the writing the, writing out the narratives for these story paintings and that to me that that's the, that's huge. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what the, the writing, phobia of writing, phobia of filling out forms, you name it. Uh, these were a lot of things that kept me out of grad school for such a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that was really an enormous, uh, biggest thing for me that the school did for me. That you know, leads us really nicely into a question we just got from Kate Holt, which was, I'd love to hear how Mark's writing has influenced his work. And um, that's a really interesting question. She also said, I'm interested to hear how his writing intersected with his closeness to childhood unconscious in his work. Yeah, wow. Um, thank you, Kate. So it, it, it did, it's, um, and, and it still is like I'm still not as much, but I'm I I find I actually find writing really painful, um, and it's uh, it, I don't I don't write that often, um, but I'm still working on uh, another three chapters, and there's there's more, you know, as you write. It's, it's interesting because it's also, um, when you get into dealing with memory, it's, it's, you know, it is our own memory, but what is actually, what's actually real, what's actually true. Um, and so through writing, you know, you can hopefully discover that, but ultimately uh, the writing is just a vehicle to substantiate the painting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Perfect. Thank you, Mark. Um, the next question is from a fellow NMG artist, Gail Spain. She says, what is it about the act of painting that is compelling to you? In other words, why painting instead of another discipline? And then she follows it up with, is there a difference between an image and a picture? Oh, that's, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, yeah, so when I started in, uh, in art, um, you know, I was a pretty horrible student all the time. And uh, right from the get go, I failed the second grade. And so, um, it, you know, it was, it was pretty tough. And I, I was always, uh, I was always the kid that, that drew and made art. Well, my childhood best, best buddy, Harold. I don't know, I think Harold might be, be here. I hope so. And uh, we used to, we used to do uh, uh, exquisite corpses all the time. And we were, you know, my brother Danny was always running for student council president and I was always drawing his posters and you name it. And um, so we're as always the kid that drew, but um, I think that uh, I'm losing my train of thought here. Uh, sorry. So it's, um, can you repeat that? Lillian? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what is it about the act of painting that is compelling to you? So why painting instead? Yeah, of why painting? painting? So, okay, so I started, uh, my, my first thought um, was maybe to be a sculptor. And when I, my, my first uh, two years at, at Western, I did a lot of sculpture and I love building. And, uh, you know, maybe, you know, I grew up in, in a family that, you know, we didn't really know any painters. And what was a painter, right? Um, and so maybe I always thought, well, building is something, maybe it's a bit more macho or something of that regard. But I, I once I started painting, I fell in love with the medium. And this is the other thing that's happened back then when I was just starting out. Uh, when you have a learning disability, and you're told that you uh, basically you're pretty rubbish at everything. When I started painting, I got an immediate um, response from my tutors and my teachers. And so then you want to do it more and more and more. And because look, we all want to be great at something, right? And or we all have that hope. And so it locked in. Um, and uh, you know, I, I still, I still love the medium to this day. There's, there's a million different mediums out there, but, uh, um, it's, you know, 25 years later or more. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Uh, quick follow-up from Amy Brown Price. She asks Pinafore three HMS Pinafore, please explain the title. Where did you come up with oh, the title Pinafore? Yeah, Pinafore. So I know that um, that's for a, uh, isn't it for like a, a girl's rock or something? The actual word Pinafore, but where we grew up in St. Thomas, the little creek behind our house led into um, a pond called Pinafore. And so it, it's as simple as that. Or I think they call it a lake now. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, yeah, Lake Pinafore, which was right on, on Pinafore Park and uh, our backyard sort of led into that. Got it. Um, I wondered the same question, so that's <laughs> good to know. I, I like the word, Yeah. So regardless of the meaning. I think it's right. quite, quite a beautiful word. Um, Jade Olson asks, Mark, how do you get started on a painting? How do you get from sketch to canvas? I find it so hard to make that transition. Yeah, I think that's one of the, uh, uh, I, I totally understand that feeling. You know, load up your palettes and just put paint on the canvas. Um, uh, you know, one of my first lessons in painting was uh, I was waiting for the teacher to come around and uh, show me what to do. And excuse my language, but he said, you got fucking paint, put it on the canvas. And that was it. And I said, wait, what? And uh, I, I, and and that was it, you know. Um, I started to draw with the paint, you know. Um, 
one of the next lessons was uh, he came around and pointed and said, that's a beautiful line. And I thought, I'm painting. What are you talking about line? But it was this idea of draw with the paint as much as you paint with the paint. Mm -hmm. And I started out always, always paint first. So always start drawing with the paint or painting with the paint. And that's that how I start. I start that way still today. There's, there's sometimes I might, I might make like a colored oil ground to start on, which can be fun. Um, you know, so you're not faced with just a giant white mm -hmm. square or rectangle. Right. So, yeah. Thank you so much. That was excellent advice. Um, Lynn asks, what age group do you teach at Marymount and what do you teach them? Oh, um, so I teach uh, grades three, four, and five. And so they're ages really probably eight to, uh, eight to 10 years old in that range. And um, we teach them uh, everything. And now I have them uh, making sculptures and, um, you know, for, uh, we're doing a revolutionary voice project right now. And I have them uh, drawing their revolutionary characters. And um, I'm always, I'm always in the hope to uh, give these kids uh, to inspire them and, and so that they walk away with just not your typical kid art as well. Like they're to, to, you know, I try and give them the best materials and the best chance to uh, hopefully give them this idea when they're making something to uh, have a wow, a wow moment, mm -hmm. get them hooked in that regard. But they're, they're great. I mean, it's exhausting. Trust me. Um, there's other teachers in here, but, but it's, 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 it's good. It's good. And it seems like a lot of that job, um, you're physically at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Yeah, yeah, so that's the biggest, that's the most beautiful thing. So the school is right across the street from the Met and the building I'm in, um, it doesn't have, have a, uh, an, an art studio. So uh, Marymount rents the Carroll classroom at the museum. So I, each day I take my classes over to the museum and then we are allowed, you know, we can go up into the collections um, which is great source of inspiration and come back down into uh, the classroom and, and make work. Do you think teaching fuels your own process or? Uh, it's, see, you know, this is my fourth year there and um, it, it is, I, I've started a, a, a very large work on my musings through the Greek and Roman um, collection, which I, I sent, Lillian a little little image of that and um so it sort of started to seep in but um yeah it's uh yeah wonderful um Lillian do you have more questions I'm I'm looking I have um Kimberly just says great share mark love your work style expression and sentimentality um but I think should we uh call it a day and I, I have a few things I'd like to say. Go for it. <laughs> okay. Thank you all for coming. And Mark, I am so uh, moved by learning more about you. And I, if I didn't have a gallery, there's no way I would have met you. And I, I really value that a lot. Thank you. One other thing I wanted to say was, um, we've been doing these gallery talks for a number of years now. And we're just amazed because we had between 80 and over 100 people sign up for today's event, which is quite powerful for all of us to realize that there's that interest. So keep coming, we love it. And the other thing I just wanna mention is if you, I don't know if any, any of you saw the catalog for the show, can you see this? Yes. Yeah. And Lillian, who is so fantastic, 
designed it. She designs all our catalogs and am I lucky <laughs> to have her. And uh, if you want to buy a catalog, they're not that expensive, but they're $20 and you know, pretty much covers things. And it's a beautiful picture for you to have the catalogs. Exactly. Yes, we have only a limited supply. So if you're interested, uh, feel free to email me and I'll be happy to tell you the details about how to purchase a catalog. And I think this was just such a wonderful talk. Thank you for everyone um, who came and asked such good questions and made excellent comments. Um, Mark's exhibition story paintings will remain on view in our viewing room through February 25th. Um, so definitely take another look. And thank you again to everybody and to Mark for this excellent talk. Yeah, thank you everyone. Really appreciate it.